I'll turn it over to our uh, MC in just a second. I wanted to thank everyone uh, for, for coming here. Uh, this is one of my favorite events. Uh, we get to see uh, all the uh, brilliant research that our students are doing um, and presented to us in a way that you know we can understand it if it's not in our discipline. Um, it's quite important that uh, we're able to communicate our research to broad audiences. Uh, as academics, especially when I was brought up, we were trained to really be able to communicate to those within our disciplines, right? Uh, and it's important to have a, an impact on our on our fields, but I think it's as important uh, to be able to communicate what uh, we do, our research, our science, uh, to a broader audience so that it can have an impact on society, so it can and influence uh, policy um, uh, and, and critical decision-making uh, decisions that are, that are, that are made uh, at national and international levels. So it's quite um, uh, uh, exciting for me to see uh, the results of uh, this competition. Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, Assistant Dean Shanice Kent uh, for putting this together. This is our fifth uh, annual 3MT. Uh, Shanice started it uh, when she came here uh, several years ago. Um, and we've had um, some considerable success in, in our programs. Uh, our winners have gone on and done very well at the regional and national level. In fact, we had a uh, national winner a few years back. Uh, so I want to thank all of you for coming again. I want to thank all the participants. Um, we had 25, 24 uh, who went through in a preliminary round, and now we have the six finalists. Uh, I'm quite excited to see uh, these presentations. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Soha Acosta, uh, who is going to uh, MC today. Hello. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to the 3MT competition. A bit of overview. I won't read the slide. I'll leave it up there for you. Um, but it is a research communication competition developed by the University of Queensland. So PhD students or master's students who are writing a thesis or dissertation have three minutes to tell us in terms that we can understand. I mean, again, myself, very much myself. Um, in terms of we can understand the significance of their research, their thesis, and their dissertation. Um, this was developed by the University of Queensland in 2008 and is now held on at over 600 institutions or across 65 countries worldwide. So a little bit about the history of it, and I'll just leave this up for a little bit, but you can see, oh sorry, 900 institutions. Um, and here are the rules. So everyone has to be in line with these bullet points up here, but it's a single static PowerPoint. So there can't be any movement, you know, slide transitions, animations. Um, there can't be any additional electronic media, no additional props, so just the student and their one static slide. And presentations are to be spoken words, so no poems or raps. Presentations commence from up here um, and again have to stay at three minutes or under. If they go over three minutes, um, the, the contest competitor is automatically disqualified. And thank you very much to our three judges for today. We have Melissa Connolly, um, Vice President for Communications and Marketing. Um, we have Satyan Kumar, Associate Vice President for Research, and we have Sheila Siri, Vice President for Government and Community Relations. So thank you again to our three judges. Here are the judging criteria for our judges. Did the presentation provide an understanding of the background and significance to the research question being addressed while explaining terminology and avoiding jargon? Did the presentation clearly describe the impact and or re results of the research? Did the presentation follow a clear and logical sequence? Was the thesis topic, research significant, results, impacts, and outcomes communicated in a language appropriate to a non-specialist? Did the presenter spend adequate time on each element of their presentation? Was it too long, too short, etc.? Um, a little bit of engagement and communication. Did it make us want to know more? Did they convey their enthusiasm? Did they capture and maintain the audience's attention? Were they careful not to trivialize or generalize their research? Did they have sufficient stage presence? And did the PowerPoint slide enhance the presentation? 
And here are prizes. So first place will be $1,000, second place $750, third place $500, and then we do have people's choice, so please do not leave. You will have the opportunity to vote for who you would like to win people's choice. Well, and with that, we will begin. We have Jamie Coro um, from Biomedical Sciences. I study tuberculosis, usually I get the following response. Why? Do people even still get TB anymore? I mean, we don't have to worry about that. That's a thing of the past. Well, it, we're not, so I'm going to ask you the following question. When I say tuberculosis, what comes to mind? It might be, if you're like me, a dark and dreary Victorian overcrowded city with crowded and uh, cramped quarters, perfectly primed for the spread of disease. And you know what, in the United States, it may not be as imminent of a threat as it was 200 years ago, but I can assure you it is far from an antiquated ailment that affected only our ancestors. In fact, the WHO estimates that about 2 billion people worldwide are infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes TB, with the greatest burdens in India, Africa, and Asia. Prior to COVID, it was the number one cause of death by an infectious agent. So how do we treat TB? Well, it's a cocktail of antibiotics taken for six to nine months. I have difficulty with a one-week Z-pack. Six to nine months, that's unfathomable. So you might be asking yourself, why do you have to take it for such a long period of time? Well, I can tell you that actually, within the first eight weeks, most bacteria are actually dead. This extended drug regimen is used to target what are called bacterial persisters. As the name implies, these bacteria are able to persist. And even though they don't have intrinsic antibiotic resistance, they have acquired non-hereditary and transient antibiotic tolerance. And even though the mechanism is not tr fully understood, it's attributed to the slowing down of cellular growth and metabolic processes. So unfortunately, our antibiotics are mainly effective against actively growing bacteria. So that's going to ask us to the following question. How can we increase the susceptibility of these persistent bacteria if our antibiotics are not working so great against them? And our lab tries to answer this question by looking at ribosome hibernation. And what we found is that during chronic TB lung lesions, uh, there is zinc starvation, which causes ribosome hibernation in the bacteria. And ribosome hibernation is basically the inactivation and stabilization of non-translating ribosomes through the binding of this protein called MPY to the ribosome. And what my research really looks at is the changes of physiology during ribosome hibernation. And I found some really interesting things. One, the bacteria, when they have hibernating ribosomes, they're completely viable, the cells don't grow, they're growth arrested. You know what? They're actually more antibiotic tolerant. And most importantly, I've found that if you treat mice with isoniacid um, after infected with TB, the the rate of bacteria with hibernating ribosomes increases, uh, meaning that these are contributing to the bacterial population persisters. Hopefully, we can use this to maybe make one day a TB a thing of the past. The next presentation will be a video, and this is by JJ Cathy um, in Biodiversity Conservation and Policy. 2014, someone in Pennsylvania decided to order some decorative landscaping stone from China, presumably because the stone over here wasn't pretty enough. Turns out there were some stowaway insect eggs on that stone, which is how a pest called spotted lanternfly got introduced. First of all, they're gorgeous. Second, they have bark-penetrating mouth parts to suck sap in over 100 species of plants. And third, they can lay eggs on non-natural surfaces like cars or trains. Unsurprisingly, they're spreading across the U.S. like wildfire and sucking the sap out of everything, tons of forest species and agricultural crops. That causes tons of issues, decreased climate resilience for forests, major losses for farmers, and a very real decline in outdoor enjoyment if you're anywhere near an infestation, but a less obvious impact might be its effect on watershed health. A watershed is just the area of land that all water has to cross in order to get into a water body. Watershed health can be determined by how natural of a journey that is. Does the water slowly sink into forest soil and trickle down into a stream? Or does it hit pavement, turn exposed cropland into mud, and collect chemicals on its way down a hillside? More healthy forests means better water quality. That's why, back in the 1930s, New York City opted to build a system to funnel some nice, fresh Catskill Mountain drinking water downstate. 
That system is the Catskill-Delaware watershed system, but another system has since been built closer to the city, the Croton system. The mountain water is cleaner right off the bat, so it doesn't have a filtration system yet. And that's the water that makes up 90% of drinking water for what adds up to be 9 million or so New Yorkers, which is about half the people in the state. What's all this got to do with that bug? I thought you'd never ask. Not only does this bug slurp the sap out of tons of trees, which has been proven to be more harmful than just eating leaves, but it excretes sticky sugar water as it feeds, which grows mold and harms the understory. All that, plus pesticides and climate change, could mean weaker watersheds and worse water. You won't be surprised to hear that the folks assigned to spot and lanternfly management are a little overwhelmed. So to help out, I found out where those weak points are within the New York City system. I looked at each reservoir and asked, how's the water quality? How much forest is here? How much of it could get eaten? How's the climate? And in the end, I had a ranked list of the sites in order of highest risk, like the New Croton or the Conseco reservoirs downstate, and the lowest, like the Roundout or the Neversink reservoirs in the Catskills. That's all I did, point where to go first. This bug won't turn our drinking water to sludge anytime soon, but they remind us that cumulative impacts matter. Many reservoirs had zero spotted lanternfly resistant tree species, and the majority of those resistant species were already under attack by other invasive bugs. Something like this could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Controlling spotted lanternfly is a really tall order, and land managers can only be so many places at once. So this list could assist in getting to the most vulnerable sites first. We can't eradicate spotted lanternfly in an instant, but we can spend our time and effort wisely. in the communications department. Have you ever thought how we could perceive us based on the hashtags that we share on social media? Well, to answer that question, today I will be taking you through my study, how will social media hashtags influence impression formation? Assuming that we all use hashtags on social media, have you ever thought what hashtags actually are? Hashtags are the words prefixed with hash symbols that are used online to organize and search content. It all started in 1988 where tags were used on internet relay chat to group content. Chris Messina was the first one to bring hashtags to Twitter in 2007. Since then, hashtags have become part of conversations online. And a lot of scholars have found the textual and linguistic functions of hashtags. After reviewing the literature, I found that not much work has been done to understand how the framing of hashtags leads to impression formation. Besides, no scholarly work has been done to understand how the framing of hashtags leads to impression formation online. In a social information processing theory, Joseph B. Walker proposed that with time people form impressions of others based on observing new textual cues such as hashtags. Based on this theory, I was interested to understand that how using these new textual cues such as hashtags can lead to impression formation online. And therefore, I studied user's perception of personality and liking. And I studied extroversion, which means how friendly a user is, neuroticism, in which a user experiences negative emotions such as sadness and anxiety, narcissism, which is associated with extreme self-admiration, and overall liking of the profile owner. To understand user's perception, I conducted an online experiment in which participants viewed mock Instagram posts in which, which they had uh, either high or low positive, negative, or neutrally framed hashtags, after which they completed an online questionnaire. So what did we find? We found that the framing of hashtags has a significant influence on user's perception than the number of hashtags. People who used a lot of positive and many uh, post uh, Insta hashtags in their Instagram posts were perceived as extroverts. People who used negative hashtags in their posts were perceived as sad or depressed. People who posted positive hashtags in their posts were perceived as narcissists. However, people liked users who posted many positively framed hashtags in their Instagram posts. So how is my study relevant? My study makes a significant contribution, practical and theoretical contribution. Brands and marketers can use my study to frame hashtags in the social media campaigns. And also my study extends the theory in the real world where people can understand how using new textual cues on hashtags can lead to impression formation. To conclude, yes, hashtags do lead to impression formation online. Thank you. beginning 
of the COVID-19 pandemic, India underwent a nationwide lockdown with a two-day notice period from March 25, 2020, rendering millions of workers unemployed overnight. As the home to nearly 150 million migrant workers, these people were stranded across the country with no work and no place to live. Now, remember, these are workers from the informal sector with no employment contracts, health care provisions, or even a permanent place of residence in their work location. And since the lockdown could have gone on for an indefinite period of time, it led to a migrant exodus as workers across the country struggled to find ways to return home in the midst of the pandemic. Eventually, the government had to step in and organize special transportation services for them. My research investigates the impact of this lockdown on the subsequent employment and migration decisions of these workers in 2020 and 2021. Using government transport department data, I drew a random sample of migrant workers native to one state and conducted over 1,200 phone surveys in a period of two months. Using a few estimation models, I found the biggest factor influencing a migrant's decision to change their occupations, ergo occupational choice, was the ownership of agricultural land. However, the income generated from any such agricultural activity was much less in comparison to other job opportunities and especially their pre-pandemic jobs. As a result, a large fraction of these workers decided to return to their urban workplaces with the relaxation of economic restrictions over the next few months. And so we have a finding on occupational choice where people resorted to agriculture as a temporary means of sustenance until they eventually return to their original jobs. We also have a finding on reverse migration patterns where people either return to their urban workplaces or decided to stay in their villages for the foreseeable future. So this addresses a large body of literature on the impact of economic shocks on employment and livelihood with the biggest takeaway here being that these people were able to bounce back to their regular lives after a trying period of time without much external help. And that's saying a lot because this represents a section of daily wage earners who depend on a constant stream of income for their livelihood. And so I argue that it was the shutdown and not the pandemic itself that led to the migrant crisis in the first place. And so we have an institutional need to better address crisis situations like this in future by focusing immediately after the event and not hard on long-term management plans. Thank you. We're going to move on to Monica Ventura from Chemistry. How many of you drink coffee, tea, or even hot chocolate in the morning? I know I can't go a day without caffeine. Do you know where these goods come from? the Amazon rainforest, along with other products that our society uses on a daily basis, including cosmetics, cleaning products, and even some of the medications that we need. What if I told you you may never be able to use those products again? Picture this. You are part of the Wampis Nation, the first indigenous autonomous government in Peru. You live in an area that encompasses over three million acres of beautiful wildlife in the northern Amazon. When all of a sudden, you see in the news Headlines that state, illegal logging and trade in fine wood threaten Wampi's communities in the Peruvian Amazon. You start to notice that thousands and thousands of acres of endangered trees are being chopped down and traded illegally. So your home, once full of life, has started dwindling down every day. This isn't only happening in Peru, but Brazil, Cameroon, Ghana, Indonesia, Malaysia, and many other countries all around the world. Illegal logging is one of the most profitable wildlife crimes that threatens biodiversity, conservation efforts, and is also driving numerous valuable species to extinction. What can be done to prevent this? That is exactly what my research focuses on. I came up with a method that stops illegal loggers right in their tracks. To do this, I need to be able to differentiate between trees that are legal or illegal to trade when found in shipping ports. This is impossible to do visually because many different types of timber look exactly the same. Therefore, I created a method to do this chemically. For example, similar to how you may identify a human, let's say somebody robs a bank and they leave their fingerprint behind. Crime scene investigators can collect that fingerprint and screen it against a database of already known fingerprints in order to identify an individual. 
What I do is I take an unknown sample of wood, perform an analysis where the output gives its chemical fingerprint, which is specific to each tree species. Screen this against a database that was created utilizing machine learning methods in order to identify which type of tree it is. And if it is found to be a legal timber, these findings will lead to the arrest of the individual trying to unlawfully trade. This research circumvents the issues of not being able to differentiate between trees at ports visually by determining their identification through their chemical fingerprint. Ultimately, this will stop illegal loggers from being able to steal from endangered forests and lead to the salvation of wildlife in communities all around the world. Therefore, you'll never have to go a day without your cup of joe in the morning. Okay, our last uh, presenter is Chuck Young Zhao from uh, Counseling Psychology. Did you know that amongst all the racial groups of college-age young adults in the U.S., suicide is the first leading cause of death only for Asian and Pacific Islanders? If this sounds surprising or even baffling, you're not alone. My dissertation aims to accomplish two things. One, to explain the suicidal ideation of Asian college students from an interpersonal angle, and two, to come up with practical intervention guidelines. So what do we know about the suicidal ideation of Asians so far? Research has shown that in many collectivistic Asian cultures, family recognition is obtained through achievement. This particular cultural value might be closely related to what is called family perfectionism. That is the experience of perceiving a gap between one's performance and the often unrealistic high standards set by the family. While research has shown a strong connection between individual level perfectionism and suicidal ideation, few examined the effect of family perfectionism or looked into how and why the effect takes place. In my research, I found two helpful and culturally relevant theories to explain the impact of family perfectionism on suicidal ideation. On one hand, the interpersonal theory of suicide holds that suicide is a response to frustrated interpersonal needs, which includes perceiving oneself as a burden to others and the experience of unbelonging. On the other hand, the escape theory of suicide hopes that suicidal ideation is a result of a cognitive escape from meaningful interpretation of life events. Given the collectivistic nature of Asian cultures, this could point to another importance but less deadly variable in the literature, relational meaning in life, that is the presence of and a search for meaning in life through interpersonal relationships. Taking the two theories together, I formulated a statistical model and tested the model by analyzing data from 221 Asian college students from three campuses within the SUNY school system. Here's what I found. First, family perfectionism might lead to one feeling like a burden to the family, therefore increasing their risks of having suicidal thoughts. Second, family perfectionism might lead to one feeling unbelonged in the family, therefore decreasing their perception of, as well as search for meaning in life through family relationships. So what are some practical applications? If you are in a mental health clinician of the story, you might not be working with the student alone. It is important to assess the family culture to screen for any family perfectionism and call for family level interventions if needed. If you are the parent of the story, you, it might be worthwhile to pause and reassess whether family perfectionism exists in a family and how to facilitate meaning in life through family relationships. If you are the student of the story, please reach out for professional help. You are good enough. You are not a burden. You belong and you deserve to have a good time experiencing and searching for a meaning in life. Thank you very much. So we have the results. I want to congratulate uh, all the um, competitors. That was a great job. I want to thank again our judges for taking time out of their extremely busy day. Uh, really appreciate it. I um, hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, I certainly did. Without further ado, we'll go to uh, first, second, and third place winners, uh, and then our people's choice. Um, we actually had to go to a tiebreaker to break the first place uh, um, to, to select the winner. So it was very close competition. Uh, first place uh, goes to Monica Ventura. <laughs> Uh, Tara Curley is here. She'll see you afterwards. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Second place went to Jayanta Kalakner. Uh, and third place went to JJ Cat. Cat. Oh, it was, uh, um, and the People's Choice also went to Monica. <laughs>